Well, welcome everybody to the panel discussion about uncertainty in subsurface conditions and impacts upon the stakeholders in the project. So this recording is actually an encore presentation, at least of the first part, because of the AV issues that we had in the actual uh, meeting in, at Ipsy in Orlando. So we're re-recording so you'll have a good clear uh, voice to go along with the first part of the presentation. So this panel discussion uh, is a follow-up of one that we had previously in at DFI in New Orleans, and it's sort of a prelude to an organizational meeting uh, that we have we will have in the afternoon of today's uh, conference to uh, bring together a number of different uh, perspectives relating to risk and uncertainty in subsurface conditions. So I'm pleased to introduce the panel and make a few introductory remarks. So next slide, please. So I'll start it off with uh, this little quotation from a 19th century philosopher about low bidding and risks and making things a little cheaper. So I'm not going to read this. I'll let you to read it on your own. But I think it's a good it's a good start to our uh, discussion about risk and construction. Next slide. So I'm not really talking about risk of failures of foundations or geotechnical elements per se. What I'm really talking about here is risks uh, relating to uncertainty in a subsurface condition and how it affects the delivery of the project. As I note here, risks uh, of physical failures of structure foundations are relatively uncommon. But these risks that we're going to discuss today are actual, quite, actually quite common. And the risks I'm referring to are something is different or unanticipated or not well understood at the time of procurement, resulting in a delay to the project, things not delivered on time, cost budget cost overruns uh, disputes over who's responsible for what cost differing site conditions etc uh, performance expectations not being met or changes to the design or scope of work changes that are necessitated because of a lack of clarity or uncertainty about uh, the conditions at the time of bidding next slide please so a key aspect of this is how subsurface risks are identified and how they are allocated to the various parties involved in the project. And shown here, owner, the civil structural engineer, the geotechnical engineer, the general contractor, specialty subcontractors. And I didn't show arrows going between all of these because it varies depending on the type of contract delivery conventional bid build, where normally the engineering folks work for the owner, design build, where there is maybe uh, some cooperative effort between contractors and designers because design is a part of that contract, design build finance, CMGC, where, or construction manager general contractor, where the engineers are still working for the owner, but the contractor is involved in the design. So all of these things affect how subsurface risks are identified and allocated between the various parties. And we try to have on this panel representatives of all the various uh, portions of the work uh, that you'll hear from today. Next slide. So here's my question to the panel um, that I hope to get uh, some perspective, uh, and then we'll have a good discussion with the audience 
uh, questions from the field. But uh, for the various panelists, from your perspective, what are the most important issues that our industry needs to confront and develop consensus or best practice in, in order to improve practice related to subsurface risk? And again, I'll emphasize that this is sort of an opening, an opening bid, if you will, <laughs> for our uh, subsequent uh, industry-wide task force that we hope to uh, develop some consensus and identify what are good practices, what are best practice uh, moving forward. Next slide. So you see here uh, the panelists. We have owner, attorney, general contractors of various types, specialty contractor and geotechnical engineer. And uh, you'll hear from each of these folks in order. And I'm going to start by introducing our first uh, panelist from the owner's perspective, Florida Department of Transportation, Mr. Greg Sheese. Manager of the Strategic Initiatives Office of the Florida Department of Transportation. And I'm happy to answer the question that Dr. Brown put forth. The Strategic Initiative Office, along with many others in the field of finance, engineering, and our legal office, are heavily involved with our alternate contracting program. As such, we deal with risk sharing and the development of our contract language for design build projects and P trades. In association with our structures and geotechnical experts, we also develop and implement guidance specific to the type of geotechnical information that should be obtained and shared with the proposers. So my response to the question is, uh, the geotechnical experts in conjunction with the prime contractors need to convince an owner of why a comprehensive baseline geotechnical report is critical to the success of a project. The geotechnical experts need to make their case at the appropriate time in the development of the project. The best way to do that is by sharing specific details on how a comprehensive baseline geotechnical report has a tangible benefit to the success of the project in terms of cost and the schedule. Thank you. Uh, with that, and having mentioned now the topic of different site conditions, I'll throw it to the uh, resident attorney, Rick Cowson. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for including me. Uh, this is part two of this panel. Uh, I know some of you were with us in New Orleans, but I think a greater number may not have been. So we're just going to do a little bit of review. Don't worry, I'm not going to go for 15 or 20 minutes, whatever I did in New Orleans. But there's just some background that's going to be important from my points today. I'm going to mostly talk about design build and how unforeseen conditions are handled in design build contracts, largely from the perspective of the contractor. But in order to even get there, we still need to review a couple of the basic tenets of construction law. So 1918 was a critical year in all of your lives. You may not know it, but you'll know it when you leave today. For Bob Tani, my good friend in the back, of course, 1918 was the last year the Red Sox won the World Series until their 86-year wait until 2004. But for you, who are not Red Sox fans, or if you are a Yankee fan, that was actually a good 86 years. 1918 is when the Spearing Doctrine was created by the United States Supreme Court. And it did change the lives of all the players that Dan talked about. But the Spearing Doctrine provides is that if the contractor builds per plan and facts, there are defects or deficiencies in the result. The owner and designer own those defects and deficiencies, and the contractor is entitled to additional compensation. So that's the key item to understand when you deal with uh, different site conditions claims, like I'm going to talk about briefly today. Next slide, Dr. Brown. Dan, can you go Okay, you did. Yes, you did. I'm sorry. I was still thinking about those 86 years of course. Of the All right. Um, but design don't change it all. If you heard the owner's perspective, and I hate to speak for the owners because I don't represent them too often, but as a good lawyer, you have to understand the perspective of the other side. So from the owner's perspective, it's a design don't contract. I give the design to the contractor. I'm out of it. Spirit is not in my life anymore. 1918 never happened. And that's certainly a very attractive perspective. 
couple questions I'm going to ask. Uh, they're not really hypothetical, but maybe from a contractor's perspective, they're a bit rhetorical. So think about these. Should the owner still be responsible for defects and the design information provided to the contractor? You heard the owner perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the answer to that from the owner's perspective is no, absolutely not, never, none of it. But from the contractor's perspective, if I am relying on information, design information provided to me by the owner that helps to create my design, so to speak, as the foundation of my design, why should I be responsible for any defects in that? And the same would be true for um, any program information provided by the owner to the contractor. So if you get program information that's simply not buildable, should you be responsible for that? Move the page, please. All right, so the question is, and this already came up, which is wonderful, it's come up twice today. Uh, Terry Holman uh, called, emailed me about this, and then we had a private meeting, so to speak. And we heard from the owner's perspective, should the contractor accept the contractual provision that the design and program documents are, uh, are for information purposes only? Um, on a public project, you sort of really don't have a choice. Then the question becomes, are they enforceable? And a typical design bid build contract, in most states that provision is not enforceable. However, you get into a design build contract, So from the contractor's perspective, I'd be negligent in my talk with you today if I didn't give you action items to the home, action items for critical. So from the contractor's perspective, in any design build contract, public or private, I want to have a really good I heard the design and program information that was provided to me by the owner, right, and I want to put on the owner, especially on a private job, this? as much of the stuff. Also, always want to get my indemnification uh, liabilities and what I should and shouldn't be indemnifying the owner for. And then, in a dream world, which sometimes we all get to do this, I want to put a cap on my damages, such as consequential damages that may arise from any deficiencies in my design. So that's a lot to think about, and I turn it back to Dan. Thank you, Rick. And so uh, from that, uh, we'll turn to Terry Holman with the general contractor perspective. Hey, Dan. So point of introduction, so I'm the, I'm the chief geotechnical engineer for a construction company. So as the chief geotechnical engineer for the construction company, I actually see a wide range of project types. I see uh, both construction management, construction management at risk, um, design build, uh, and even partial design build projects is a part of my general profile. And that's both vertical construction as well as what I would call large horizontal or large lateral construction. Uh, not linear transportation features like highways, but rather airports, convention centers, things that have obviously quite a, quite a significant footprint. So uh, in thinking about this topic a little more, I've come up with a, a list of, I guess, six or seven main items um, that I've identified as, I think, most important to improve our practice. Uh, the first it is seemingly obvious. It's, it's to, um, you know, to really push for sufficiency of subsurface information and evaluation of variability and conditions is a critical component for any project. They're only going to that I'm going to expand on that a little bit in the next couple of moments. The second point was really the uh, that investigation programs be developed project by project that are applicable to the intended or necessary design and construction activities. Oftentimes, a geotechnical engineer, and again, I've been a conventional consultant as well as a specialty contractor in my career, but Oftentimes, the technical engineer is provided very little applicable information other than extremely preliminary information by either the owner or by the structural engineer, the architect, et cetera, uh, in the process of even planning the initial stage of an investigation. So uh, I see that as an important thing. Uh, you know, this can be, frankly, this can be the communication fault of the owner, architect, structural engineer that's possibly 
Uh, and, and really what this leads into is in a, in a good project practice, uh, the adoption of stage investigation programs that reduce the spatial uncertainty, that's both laterally and, and vertically, um, the, the range of geotechnical properties and parameters, and, and really get the investigation eventually, and in a, again, in a, in a piecewise fashion, get the investigation and the recommendations in sync with the design development process. The geotechnical investigation process is not stopped when the report is thrown over the fence at the design. It's a living thing. It frankly should be evolving even to the onset of and, and into construction. It's a live thing. We're always obtaining more information. We have to respect the, the, the owners and the other project stakeholders have to respect the need and, and really look to be a role in geotechnical engineering to continue to package, assess, uh, evaluate, and, and allow the design to evolve as a part of this increasing information base. Uh, I definitely advocate, by virtue of a lot of my free like other experiences in the linear transportation sector, for large projects, especially design build, I advocate very strongly for the use of a GBR concept. Uh, as a way of setting contractual basis and expectations, specifically as it relates to um, properties, subsurface properties, uh, inferred or implied stratigraphy. This is a playing field for both bidders. And then in construction as well, it sets the playing field for all parties to be able to track what constitutes changes that are outside of the contractual bounds and outside of the information. And just before you go on, beyond GBR, geotechnical baseline, of course. I, mean, I, want, to, I, want, I want to take up one lecture on the one that the other experts there and then certainly the uh, linear transportation side expand on that quite a bit. But it's, I'm going to Leave that here again. Uh, the other point, one of the other points I wanted to make is that I believe it's, it's, it's crucial, and I see a lot of different types of contracts and contract documents. I believe it's crucial that, 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 that we communicate and establish the case law state by state, and, and obviously there's, there's a, a, a need to do it on a federal level as well. It dismisses the ability of owners or contract offers, and that can even be made as, a, as an offer or a subcontract, the, to claim that the subsurface data and reports developed as part of the product may not be relied on information. Unless I am unless I am forced to, or I'm forcing a sub to literally buy the site, it is it is it's implausible to push that down on people working on a project. The information is obtained and it is done in a manner that is consistent with good standard practice. It, it must be construed as relied upon information. And I know for a fact that in many jurisdictions that typical contract clause which will show up in both private work and public work will not stand in court. So it's, it's almost, it's almost uh, not sensible to even throw it into contract documents and leave it out there like that. Uh, we have to stop the process of low bidding geotechnical practices. We have to truly stop being cheap with investigation budgets, and we have to encourage uh, our owners and, and obviously design build teams to consider the you know, design costs, claiming scheduling packs, rather than simply try to constrain front end costs on the job. A billion dollar design build job. I'm not one for setting a magic number as a, as a, hey, we should have an investigation that is a blank percent of the anticipated construction cost. But I truly believe that we have to look at, again, the cost benefit ratio, so we're going to break it down on the economic basis, if you will. But look at, at the benefits of, of really stopping that practice uh, rather than constraining those front end costs for somewhat arbitrary reasons because you want to. The construction and cost, when we have problems in and insufficiencies in subsurface investigation and setting of contractual baseline criteria, 
is absolutely the construction element cost absolutely dwarfs the front end cost of projects for like the entirety of my career. Uh, and lastly, what I want to say is that you know before I throw the you know, where this all goes, I think specifically for design build projects or design build elements of projects. And within Turner, sometimes we call that um, we call that delegated design. You know, when we put a contractor and say you're a contractor or a subcontractor, you will do uh, either foundation design or excavation support design, one of those things. I think it is critical for more and more use of performance specifications to govern geotechnical work under these situations. Oftentimes, even the geotechnical engineer, and certainly the owner, architect, structural engineer, are not in a position to adequately address these things in a set of contract documents, specifically as it relates to these outmodes of work, where means and methods, frankly, are a driving part of design and performance of these structures in general that are a part of. And I think lastly, just to, to sum up my my kind of point in the um, in the construction management, you know, heavy large GC role, you know, where does all this go? Well really what it goes to is you know we have to establish two pots of cost and schedule contingency on projects. Pot number one is design contingency. Pot number two is construction contingency. And Failure to properly plan and allow for adequacy and again an involvement of geotechnical investigation has a direct impact on both of those things. So design can go off track with a poorly planned, poorly executed, and unfortunately constrained geotechnical practice and investigation, uh, just as much as the construction can spin off into uncontrolled. Uh, territories with, as, as Rick said, you know, claims, uh, you know, debates, frankly, over what constitutes change conditions, one of the things that we face on every job. So, again, back to you as a Thank you, Terry, for a good perspective and, and general contractor. Next slide, Camille. Yeah. So, my first started uh, 20 years ago with the reconstruction of Interstate 15 in Salt Lake City. Uh, at that time, it was the largest design build job in, in the country, and have progressed through other design build pursuits and projects, uh, both in Canada and the United States. Um, my perspective here is is really my thoughts on how we improve the practice of addressing these subsurface risks, and, and my focus is on the information that's provided pre-bid for this design build team to be able to put a preliminary design and a cost estimate for the project. Design codes, particularly in infrastructure, um, will, will, we will go out and get all the subsurface information that we need to be able to come up with the final design of the project. But my perspective is the information that we have that forms the basis of the project and the cost and the bid uh, at bid time. Uh, it, it is my belief that to improve the practice, uh, this pre-bid geotechnical information needs to define the important factors that will, will significantly impact the cost and the schedule. Um, we want the project team and the owner to think about the subsurface information and be providing enough information at this time. Uh, you know, we're looking at trying to get competitive proposals, um, and it has to include a clear definition of the ground conditions. Uh, in the perspective of design build work, um, we would like to see that effort focusing on the characterization of the site. We're going to prepare designs. We're going to prepare concepts. What we need is a clear definition of those subsurface conditions there. So my context through here would be is in a focus is, is to spend a few minutes to help you understand from our perspective how this geotechnical baseline report can reduce the site investigation risk. The context are, are two projects that we've had in Honolulu here, and it's a, an elevated guideway supported on model shaft foundations, essentially <laughs> roughly at 125 foot spacings, but it goes over 16 miles. This was a project where baseline reports were provided by Parsons Brinkerhoff, now uh, WSP, essentially using boring space at about 500 foot intervals through there. 
Uh, this is an example of the documents that we were provided through there. And, you know, in, in this particular picture and the things that we liked about it and used is, is that the ground conditions are easily visualized. Um, the key soil and rock layers are identified. And in this particular instance, you know, we have profiles. So these are not individual boring logs, but we had information that we could use at this pre-bid stage to have some understanding of what the ground conditions were between the borings, recognizing that you know, at every 125 feet in final design, we're going to define those conditions for the basis of the final design, but this is telling us what do we think the ground conditions are at bid time. So the other things we think that were very important that, that, that PB put together through there is, is they said they told us in the contract documents that the owner's defined purpose is to help define the contractual ground rules of the bidding process in regards to allocation, definition of geotechnical risk. The baselines are developed, which will serve as a contractual basis for comparison with the actual conditions encountered during foundation construction. So the ground conditions are defined at bid time. We, will, we went out through there and determined what the, the conditions were in the process of final design, but we had some basis of being able to understand if there was a difference, how did it impact the design, and how were the costs allocated there. And probably most importantly, the contract said that the contractor may rely on these baselines in preparing the price proposal. And for this $800 million job, um, there have been no claims associated with the subsurface conditions for this project there, and one more. And my personal opinion here is that everyone's interest, from the owner to the designer to the contractor, is well served by having this contractor's project team at bid time focus on dealing on how to deal with the subsurface conditions rather than spending significant amounts of time and effort to first define what those conditions are. It's also important, I believe, to have those subsurface conditions defined for all of the project teams so that they're all looking at the same thing. In my opinion, the owner's geotechnical engineer can materially improve this particular issue through there, but they have to spend time and it costs money. Last subject would be, is, at least from our experiences, these baseline geotechnical reports can reduce the subsurface risk for everybody. And I presume it took contingency out of the bid that you would put together. It, it all, you always have something that's going in through there, but, but the normal discussions with contingency went away. And there was this degree of reliability that we felt that when we went out and determined the ground conditions, that we would have a fair and equitable method to be able to adjust that. Now, in that adjustment, you know, the, the, the baseline report said that if things got better and it cost less, we had to give money back. And if things cost more, we obviously did that. And in this particular project, the things that went better essentially matched the things that went worse. And there wasn't a significant adjustment in the, co in the project cost there. And that was probably, probably in, due in part to um, the investigative work that Parsons Brinkerhoff did to be able to start the study there. Thanks, Steve. Go up to Rick Shank for the specialty subcontractor. Hello, my name is Rick Desha. I'm Vice President of Engineering with Nicholson Construction. I have spent uh, about seven years on the geotechnical consulting side. Uh, prior to construction, as well as a few years in academia. I've been with Nicholson for about 14 years. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the focus of our group's discussion is really subsurface risk. But I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just talking about risks that are specific to subcontractors. And so you'll see the three grayed out points at the bottom of the slide, and I'm just going to touch on those for a few seconds and then come back to uh, the first two topics. Uh, when I say shopping out designs, what we find is that a specialist will sometimes come up with a great idea and bring it to the owner or the client uh, and try to introduce it and convince them that they can save them time or money. 
but sometimes the reaction is from the client said, well, now that I've got this great idea, I think I want to send it out for pricing and get competitive bidding for it. And in such as in a case like that, the specialist doesn't get any value for their idea. Uh, unfortunately, this happens a lot, and it's very difficult to control, especially when you bring a good idea and you tell them you can save them money, and, and then you have to tell them, well, I can't tell you what it is just yet. I just need you to sign up. Uh, a variation of this is when the general contractor descopes your work uh, with the uh, intent of managing their own risk, but then likes the idea and decides to self-perform the work. Unfortunately, this happens uh, far too often as well. The uh, second point down there is mixed or poor specifications. Uh, we often see uh, what I'll call mixed specifications, which essentially is um, you're being told what performance to meet, but also how to do it. So they're providing both performance uh, and means and methods. And the, the challenge with that is that uh, sometimes the two are incompatible. Uh, you can't do what is being asked to do with the methodology being used. And sometimes it's uh, just not bringing optimum value to the client. It's just overly conservative. Uh, the last point uh, that I'd like to make that's specific to subcontractors is uh, consultants working for both the owner and also for a, a specialty contractor. And this uh, works, uh, uh, you know, talk about having a firewall in place to make sure that there's no communication back and forth. And that sounds reasonable, but in theory, it, it really doesn't work. Uh, often the consultant is part of the review process and, and on the selection team. And, you know, I, I'm not against um, an owner being able to choose who they want to work with, but I think that if they do have a consultant that they want to be part of a design build team, then they should hire that person and negotiate or that company negotiate directly instead of engaging other contractors who are really there just to provide uh, competitive uh, or to provide check prices. A variation of this is, is consultants who have a c contractor arm. Um, There's just a, a, a conflict, in my opinion, uh, of interest. So now I'll go back to the, the main topic and, and talk about uh, risks associated with subsurface investigations. And I'd like to start with uh, uh, presentation, a summary of a presentation I saw about 10 years ago. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this uh, information comes from uh, Tim Chapman. Tim Chapman was with Arup in the UK, and uh, I think it was 2008 when I saw him make an outstanding presentation. I'm just going to summarize uh, some of the data that he presented, and this is related to vertical construction. So this is primarily, uh, uh, you know, building work in, in large cities. And after looking at a lot of data, what he, he showed was that the cost of the substructure is about 5% of the cost of a building, yet it's responsible for about 50% of project delays. Um, and he said that overall, 20% of projects have significant delays that are caused by the ground. Um, and with that, he looked at the costs associated with investigations, and he said that Usually less than about 0.1% of the building cost is spent to define ground conditions. And so we see the uh, subsurface risks be an important part of that being inadequate investigations. And there's a couple types of inadequacies I'd like to comment on. Um, one is just in the scope. The scope of the investigation is just not adequate. And when you look at that, it's often because the buyer decided to uh, get low price to, to uh, bid out the investigation based upon price, not necessarily based upon the quality of work. And, and this is generally a bad idea, especially when you see all the risks associated with subsurface investigation. Uh, think about doctors and lawyers. You wouldn't want to get the cheapest one. And I think the detailed investigation is a similar concept. The other areas where the uh, subsurface investigation is insufficient is in the kind of data that's gathered. Uh, good exploration programs require uh, that the data be gathered specific for the techniques that are going to be used. And so if the if there's going to be specialist work involved, it's important to get the uh, specialist involved early in the process so that you know what kind of data to gather uh, in order to make the uh, design meaningful. A lot of the subsurface risks that you'll encounter are related to groundwater. So Gathering and understanding the groundwater should be a big part of the investigation program, especially for 
uh, underground work, you know, excavation support type project, projects. Um, so establishing the information with piezometers, doing pump tests, measuring whether you have artesian conditions or not are important. Uh, the other part of investigations that I think are good value are just getting lots of good index tests. Often we'll see Atterberg limits without water contents, and that's that doesn't make much sense to me because the Atterberg limits are, are form the bounds of the liquid limit and the plastic limit, and knowing the water content helps you understand the behavior someplace in between. So lots of Atterberg limit tests and water contents in clay soils are valuable. And then gradation tests are relatively inexpensive, but also provide a lot of insights, especially for, for grouting projects. So the last uh, uh, point, I guess, is we're calling it a sculptatory risk transfer, sculptatory language. Uh, and this relates to projects in which uh, statements are made that the geotechnical information that's provided is uh, only for information, it's for information only, and it's not part of the contract documents. In other words, you don't have any geotechnical information that you can rely on contractually. Um, there's just no logical justification for this in my mind, or logical justification for this in my mind. Um, you know, it's the owner's ground, the owner should be responsible for it, and there should be enough information that the uh, contractor can uh, bid and build his work. And as far as a specialist is concerned, this is even a bigger risk because if you look at a, a large project for a general contractor or a construction manager, the, the earthwork is only a small fraction of the major project or could be and therefore if there's risk associated with it, it's still only associated with 10% uh, or 5% of the overall project. For the specialist works, our work is 100% uh, geotechnical works and so the risk associated with that kind of language is even more important to the specialist. Uh, so with that, those are my comments and uh, you know, hopefully uh, people will have some questions, follow up so we can uh, discuss those. Absolutely. Do you get back charged until you're blue in the face and you're exactly right? There's a tremendous amount. It's rich, it's difficult. We, you know, we, there's, you have to walk away. Obviously, in this business, you have to know when to walk away, right? And, and in my mind, you know, sometimes you're just leaving the general contractor high and dry. You know, you'll see specifications that are written that can't be done. Like and you can see that you can see with the, the consultants in the GM, he really doesn't know what to do. He'll write an owner specification, throw it back in the general and the uh, subcontractor that's going to ultimately do the work. The general contractors are wanting you to bid the work and say, "Look, we can't do that." Well, what can we do? Well, you know, we can do something, but we can't do that, right? So then it's a matter of will it be accepted or not? Will the, the reviewing engineer be reasonable about the process? And that's sometimes yes and sometimes no. So how do you quantify? And, and uh, deal with that risk, right? So a lot of times it's just you just walk, you have to walk away, right? And it doesn't help anybody. So. Okay. This is just for sound. Oh, okay. This is just for sound for the webinar people. So. Okay, guys. Um, this is an important and diverse group. I don't know if you've really thought about that. So I've got a few things to say. Dan said, I've got to be brief. I'm from the South. I can't talk fast. So I'm going to do the best I can to just think about what we've, what we've heard here in the last 40 minutes. The owner says, get your own data. The uh, attorney says, design bill changes things. He said, and the, the old uh, design bid build environment, that won't work. Today it may. And he makes a lot of money helping the courts decide whether it may or not. The, the general contractors have been very strong in saying important to get a baseline geotechnical report in front of people when they bid these things. I love Terry's soundbite. That forces a contractor to buy the site if you can't rely on the data. So there's some really strong things going on. Uh, Rick's uh, cartoon there uh, of... The guy's shaking hands with a club behind our back. Reminds me in this very room about 40 minutes ago, an hour ago, I heard the discussion of uh, 50 years of FHWA and Ashto. And Jerry DiMaggio said he thinks what made so much progress there was trust. 
And I'm afraid that we don't have enough trust uh, between the owner, the designers, the, the contractors. And this group can do something about that. How long has it been since the Spearman document? 19 what? 19. And that's when the Red Sox won the World Series? Yes. So uh, let's don't let that much time go again until we do something really incredibly good for, for this side of the business. The, yeah, we're, we're behind. Uh, we've got to catch up with that. So, and I would add, uh, from the geotechnical engineer's perspective, we've certainly done our part to create distrust. We have learned, I've been in this business 39 years. We've learned uh, our idea of risk is how strong can you make a limitations paragraph in your report that says, we just drilled a boring and we drilled a boring over here. And we don't know what's between those borings. And we made some recommendations, but you make the decisions based on the recommendations. That's hogwash. We need to step up and be designers and work together with owners to get a good project done. I think we can make some progress. So I've got slides. So I've got some questions to ponder. Who is the geotechnical engineer when we get involved? We've, we've heard a contractor who's a geotechnical engineer, an owner. Uh, if I'm doing site characterization, am I the geotechnical engineer? What is the geotechnical engineer of record? That's a term I hear thrown about a good bit. Don't really know that we've defined that. And if I do the site characterization work and someone takes that design and I'm not consulted, we talked about the design being an iterative process. Great idea. A geotechnical engineer of record should be a continuum throughout all this, understanding what limitations they took on when they did the original characterization. And we talked about this today. What is a GBR, a geotechnical baseline report? What is a satisfactory scope? And can we build adequate quality acceptance criteria such that you can really trust that when we do have low bid environments that, you know, one guy's triaxial and another guy's triaxial may be two different tests. And it's not just uh, friction angle and cohesion, right? There's a lot more to it than that. It's a consulting effort. And so we need to become better at uh, getting a quality baseline geotechnical report. Who draws those lines between borings? You know, there's, there's a rock layer that comes in at elevation 420 and this boring and at 410 and that boring. Well, what are we going to do, engineers? We've got that straight edge and we just run it right across. Uh, well, the contractor is going to find something different if that's a pinnacle or a valley in that rock. And so now we've got to go deal with that. We're going to have to make decisions. There should be a contractual document that made it logical to draw that straight edge. How do we bring other pertinent data into the project? Um, Rick had said in the, in the New Orleans meeting that the biggest problem an owner has is discovering data that was in the vicinity that should have been discovered and revealed that comes up later in a dispute. That's kind of the smoking gun, I guess. Well, in this case, we've got abilities now to understand that. We, we have tremendous data manager systems and GIS systems. It's time to come forward with a better way to, to render that data. And how is a differing site condition defined? That question is fairly rhetorical at this point, but these are the things that we can be working on. I'll leave you with this slide, and it's to tell you two things. One, we recently, through the DFI committee that Dan talked about that I chair, the subsurface investigation, uh, we put a survey out. We had about 300 respondents. It is a very diverse group. That's what makes this powerful. And uh, if you want to know more about that, we'll be in our committee meeting this afternoon. I think it starts at 1. But look at this. We all said that clearly, if you have contract documents that do provide those expected conditions, uh, we're going to have a reduced potential for conflict. That's a no-duh for us, right? But we need to educate the people who don't understand that and say, you can gain a lot by helping us get to a continuum here that we all believe in. So thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, Vic. And we have finished in a good time, as intended, to have some questions from the floor. And I want to preface all this by saying this is really uh, an effort to kick off uh, so a pretty simple question. Given the fact that we have all this data on the GBR report, uh, do we ever use this data to determine minimum insurance coverage that we need from all the players, given that we now know the uncertainty and we can 
in advance kind of tell them, well, you need 5 million covered to go into that job. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Terry Holman. I, I, I'm going to give the, the general answer is on a on a on a job that is is private or commercial or industrial, something that is not necessarily true public sector. The answer to your question is absolutely yes, uh, and and that doesn't sometimes that goes between owner and and GCCM. Oftentimes that goes between let's say myself as GCCM down to. Unfortunately, sometimes specialty subcontractors like my friend uh, Dr. Deschamps here from from Nicholson, and and where that comes into play is sometimes it's insurance coverage relative to the contractor and his work, and sometimes it's there's an additive feature of higher imposed insurance requirements and limits on his designer of record who he's going to have. Again, remember design build work, there's another entity involved for him unless he's a, is self-performing and that is there's a design component attached to the specialty contractor and he has an insurance policy as an E&O policy that he's going to provide part of as well. Project wise, it does make sense for there to be a very intelligent set of discussions that are related to how fair but sufficient insurance minimum insurance coverages are established for projects and i think it's it's warranted to um to add one comment in here as well and then i'm going to let somebody else kind of attack this because this is a good this is a good question keep in mind that and i put together a lot of design build teams and those include architects structural engineers geotechnical engineers and then the whole myriad of people that fall kind of in the in the architectural side of, of the, the, the that design side of the business there isn't an insurance company or contract out there that a an architect or a structural engineer in particular could offer up or sign that requires them in most in, in almost any instances to take on the geotechnical engineer as part of his contract chain to take them on as a subcontractor especially for some larger jobs. Why? Because the, what we're talking about here is the typically the highest risk portion. I think, Rick, your, your statistics were very interesting. The highest risk part of that work, the E&O policies for an architect or a structural engineer will almost never be allowed to include the geotechnical engineering as being a subcontractor or a subconsultant to those entities. So we've got another problem that it relates to the insurance situation uh, that, that you have to look at on, especially small to large projects, is, is where can that insurance, uh, who has it? We don't like insurance policies. Nobody wants to use their insurance policy. I mean, it's a fact of the matter, but you know, projects have need to develop certain contractual terms in terms of limitations of liability and minimum coverages that everybody can be happy with. There's to some degree is a negotiation. Uh, uh, my name is Carl Higgins. I'm a chief engineer at UCF. I work in Washington. I'd like to revisit the concept or the discussion about the geotechnical engineer record. And it's a bit of a minefield, right? We have uh, on any typical urban project, we've got specialty contractors that are submitting uh, perhaps design, build, cheating, insuring specialty foundations. Perhaps they're even in the specifications where they're required as a design build submittal. Um, how do the geotechnical engineers of record um, inoculate themselves from liability from that, well, those those uh, subconsultants when, in fact, we may even be reviewing their work? I'm not sure. <laughs> That's actually not what I usually do. So, I mean, because you're talking about subconsultant contractual relationships. It's, it's kind of the shop growing issue, huh? 
Yeah. Uh, full disclosure, I don't regularly, re I never represent engineers, and you'll be happy to know I almost never sue you, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, look, it's like any other contract. Your proposal needs to be, when you enter into any contractual relationship, you want to initially make a proposal that's as good as it can be with all the standard inclusions and exclusions. What are you willing to do? What don't you do? What liability are you willing to accept? What liability are you not willing to accept? Send the proposal in and then aggressively negotiate your contracts. So while I typically do that for drilling subcontractors, the same applies to you. So your company needs to have your boilerplate proposal that's absolutely perfect. And then each and every contract, the time to do your battle, ladies and gentlemen, if you can, is before you do your work, not after. If you can negotiate a favorable contract that mitigates your risk, that's what you're looking to do. And that's true for any construction industry entity. So that advice is not overly specific to what you're doing, but it, it works for you just like it would work for uh, a big GC or a big technical uh, subcontractor. Yeah. So this is Vic Donald. And it, your question reminds me of another history lesson from Boston, the Tea Party. Taxation without representation. Uh, Terry told us that as geotechnical engineers, we quite often don't understand what's going to be constructed when we become the geotechnical engineer of record. And so that's why I'm so interested in moving this white paper progress, this educational effort forward so that the, the general community can understand the liabilities that we are taking on inherently, and we should have the proper compensation for that. We should not be bid uh, against each other for that. So I think there's a lot of ground to be gained with that question. So this is Dan, I'm gonna weigh in as a, a geotechnical engineer who works on a lot of design build projects. And uh, in my firm, we endeavor to try to help the design build team uh, understand the risks associated with a particular strategy or a particular construction method. Uh, understand the risks so that they can acknowledge, number one, <laughs> acknowledge there's risk with any solution. Some are less risky than others, but maybe more costly or more time consuming or whatever. So you try to become a part of the discussion about risks rather than inoculating yourself. You, I mean, you can't, it's like, it would be like getting in a fight with a pig in a pig sty and hoping to not get any mud on you. If, if things go badly, you know, you get pulled in, everybody gets pulled in, but you try to help people manage the risks uh, as effectively as possible and, and do your job. And so if you do your job well, you know, things hopefully will turn out well. And if, if they don't, uh, you know, that's why you have insurance. So we have two questions from the webinar, I'm told. Okay. So. Yeah, look, uh, Alex is a good friend, but that's a hard question. Um, I hear that it just about every deposition when I sue an owner or have a pasture claim against the owner. That report wasn't written for you and your clients, Mr. Kalsen. That was just a design report. But that's not realistic um, from my perspective because, like I said before, it classifies the site, it classifies your bid. You're working in reliance on that uh, proposal uh, on that report. So I, I, I deeply respect Alex, but as long as the report is situated in the bidding documents that are relied on by the contractors, I, I think it's used for construction. So, so maybe, maybe 
so so this is Steve say from from our perspective that's where we believe that it's very important that there be budgets established and that the geotechnical engineer has to have a role in construction I mean we, we want to avoid the problems and we do that by making to the best of our ability the geotechnical engineer to be involved in the construction we, we don't want it separated we want them part of the team we know things may change and the job needs their involvement and, and this is big just echo on that that's the beauty of where we're trying to take this interactive approach we said earlier we need staged investigations you get some things to get started. There's more information that needs to be brought along. The geotechnical engineer of record is represented throughout that. So there's there's ground to be taken here. Okay, we had another online question. Second online question is from Robert Myers. Uh, is on fitting the contextual method to geotechnical risk. risk. Um, he said some very complex geologic conditions should be conventional design, bid, build, because uh, you can't shift the risk to the contractor. Okay, I will answer that one. First, I may have some other comments on that. I agree totally that there are some things, the risks of which are so inherently high that it's the design build is not maybe the way that the contractual mechanism should be set up. Uh, for instance, uh, slope stability problems. Sometimes they are, but, so, but very often, slope stability problems are of such a character that you don't really understand the problem until you get in there to start to try to fix it. Um, I recall one project in Cleveland that was bid as a design build job a few years ago, it's the Interbelt Bridge. Uh, my team didn't win the job, but I'm recalling how, how DOT did that design build job. It, it had a lot of, uh, there were a lot of foundations, a big bridge. At one end, at one abutment, there was an ongoing uh, slope stability problem, and they prescribed a solution for that. I thought that was great. They just said, at this place, thou shalt do this thing. And that eliminated the risk associated with that, with that bit uh, from the design builder. And so they could focus on things that they could control very well. Other times I have seen some projects and I won't name them. I have seen some projects where there was one particular thing that had a huge risk associated with it and it was a bit as a design build and maybe you're trying to build a bridge and there's a slope problem on the road approaching up to the bridge and then geez the, a lot of the bidders see this big risk and throw a lot of contingency in and they don't win the job and the, the bridge construction ends up getting awarded to the contractor who had least identified the risk associated with this thing that's not even related to the bridge. So it skews the whole process. And it's, uh, you know, I, so I agree with the, the comments. Somebody else had something to say about the So Terry. Uh, wait here. It's so, so slow. No, no, I got here, here's a, here's a, I was just, I was just whispering in, in Rick's ears because as a former specialty contractor working in the Northeast of the United States, especially in, let's say the Valley and Ridge province, you know, karst conditions are the perfect example of, of when this the, when this question is is it perfectly uh, perfectly posed. It's a situation where the geologic environment is so is a living beast by itself. It's so variable. It's able to be triggered almost at any point in time. It it should. I truly believe that those are scenarios where it's it's implausible to ask for or transfer risk in terms of sometimes design build at all. Sometimes it's, it, I've heard, I've had people ask for uh, that to be done as, you know, can you give us lump sum pricing for this micropile project in, you know, the karst somewhere in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. It's, it's, it's a ludicrous concept, it, but what it belies is the offer of those, those deal terms doesn't actually maybe understand 
the level of risk that's involved and, and certainly is, is unfairly trying to ask or impose a set of, of almost impossible conditions on a, on a contractor. So that's a great example in, in, in my personal experience of, you know, of when you really ought to be at, you know, design, bid, build with a myriad of unit price line items uh, to accommodate the, the multitude of solutions needed just to get, you know, a, a competent, adequately performing, let's say, foundation system in place. You know, I think the biggest challenge is the owner wants to quantify what the cost of the project is going to be in some way. So they want to lump sum, and the reality of it is when you're in that, that environment, you're drilling and drilling and drilling until you get 10 feet of good rock, right? And you may go through, break through some kind of uh, uh, cavity or whatever until you get back down. So the only way that you can do it is, is, is a line item. There's a line item for, for length of pile mm -hmm. installed. And, um, you know, there, there's no other fair way to do it, as, as Terry was alluding to. And I will mention in terms of what Dan is saying, in terms of the slope stability problems, you still see a lot of requests for design build slope stabilization. And, and that is extreme. Everybody knows designing stabilization of slopes is a complicated process. You need very, very good information, you know, access or issues. And, and you still see it. It's out there. And. And rarely will we bid those jobs and, you know, must be an important client to us because often what happens is you have the risk of all that effort, the four competitors, five competitors, and then the biggest risk is, well, that's too much money. We're not going to do it. Right. So you've done all that work. You've, you've done, you know, weeks worth of effort, begged for additional information, and then the project doesn't even go forward, let alone the competing against a number of other uh, competitors. So. That definitely in the realm of a good quality geotechnical engineer doing that that work. Thank you. This is Ruben Ramakrishna from Hardestin and Over, uh, and I'm a foundation engineer. So one of the problem we always face is. Oh, here's the mic here. Yeah. Problem with Mike. Oh. We're talking about <laughs> engineer multitask. Figure it out. All right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is Aravind Ramakrishna from Forest in Anover. I'm a foundation engineer. So one of the problems we always encounter is protection of the adjacent structure, which are like 78 year old. And as a foundation engineer, they say, okay, if you want to protect will give you what 40 grand 50 grand per additional boring and pretty much the whole liability falls on the geotech engineer how do we address this and yes we can collect some soil samples and that's it from there onwards uh, pretty much no one is willing to take the responsibility of uh, assessing the condition and this becomes more important as uh, when it comes to design the project so any suggestions? Uh, I can take a shot at it. So in my mind, you know, asking us to protect the adjacent structure is unfair because we don't know the condition of the adjacent structure or, or what deformations it can take. Telling us a number, you know, giving us a fair shot at what is the deformation that's allowable. So a performance-based specification, I can tolerate an inch and a half of movement, vertical movement, horizontal movement. You can design to that. If that inch and a half of movement causes damage to the structure, it should not be the contractor's responsibility. And so we do see situations where it caused no damage to the adjacent structure, and we don't know if the thing's ready to fall down already, and any little bit of movement could cause a problem. So in my mind, some structural engineer has to decide on what is a tolerable amount of movement, and then you can specify the limits of that movement as part of the design approach for the supportive excavation system. Okay. I think we are at our time. So I want to thank everyone for participation. I want to mention that. Uh, hmm? Well, I want to mention that we have uh, the kickoff meeting for the industry-wide task group at uh, one o'clock. Do we know? Okay. So if people interested in participating or contributing uh, would be invited to attend. Well, that's a good
Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, one last point. I will mention the DFI, EFFC, that's European Federation of Foundation Contractors, joint international conferences in Rome, Italy in June. And we will be continuing this uh, conversation on a more international basis at that location. Thank you. Thank you.